Almost Happy New Year. That's my only voice right there is coffee. At any rate, um, hope everybody's well. I got some time now. Well, sort of. But I'm going to devote some time to doing some tying videos that I've extremely neglected to do. Um, some really fun stuff. Some cool patterns that a lot of people probably have seen slowly emerge in some of the photos on Instagram and uh, in the store. This style of fly that I'm going to show you today, you guys have seen me tie jigs before and I know this is a controversial topic among some streamer guys. Um, whatever. Here's my thing. Uh, okay, I'm already starting with a rant. But I'm going to keep it pretty positive. I really don't care what anybody fishes with. And if you have to devote your energy into knocking down what somebody else is doing and how they fish, it's ridiculous. We've all done it from time to time. It really makes no sense. My thing is, who cares as long as you're doing it ethically and you're having fun? We're all getting out there to try and recreate. So if you don't like fishing jigs, that's on you. I really don't care. I'll fish about anything. Because I like to learn. And I like to check track patterns with fish. Sometimes you need something that's going to get down in the water column and keep it in the zone with fish. That's a fact. If you're fishing a neutrally buoyant fly, in regards to streamers, in big water, it's really, really difficult, even with some of the heaviest sinking lines, to get that fly to penetrate in the zone and get into an area where that fish can see it. Case in point. Just fishing with a good friend of mine, I do this every year, huge water. It was the highest flow I've ever fished this particular system at. About three times what it typically is this time of year, even when they do a release. So, to put things in perspective, the gauge height from the dam was running between 9 to 10 feet above normal. That doesn't mean that's that's how much water is over everything else but in some areas it was exponentially deeper to put things in perspective some islands were getting swamped at the top ends um, you know water up into the trees things of that nature so if you're fishing an area that's typically three feet deep and now it might be six and the fish are pinned to the bottom your flies all day and we watched another boat do this and it's somebody I know Pound and banks, pound and banks, pound and banks. I didn't see them take a single fish all day long, and, and it was one of those deals where they're jockeying for position, fishing banks again, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the bank mentality works really well, but sometimes if those fish are pinned really low in the water column, I don't care how many banks you pound. Yeah, you might get lucky here and there, stuff a fish, but your flies more often than not are going right over the top of them. And if you've got any kind of stain or discoloration, sediment in the water, it's a good chance they're not going to see it. You need something that penetrates. Um, these things, and I got a pile of other cool stuff to show you this winter, um, are killer. Because you can get your fly down into the zone. There's so many different ways you can fish it. And yes, you can fish these on a fly line. Wait, pending. Fly line rigs, casting them. There's definitely a window of how heavy you want to go where it's going to become problematic. I typically don't like my jigs any heavier than an eighth ounce for doing that. These really shine on your tight line rigs. Everybody's like, oh my god, Rich is talking about tight line rigs and mono rigs and things of that nature. Yeah, you heard what I've had to say about it. I've had opinions on it. I've fished them before. I still fish them. Um, some people would argue you're not fly fishing, but... You know, there's been a whole group of people now that have devoted an extreme amount of time into tweaking, fine-tuning, and dialing a lot of the stuff in. And fishing these on those style rigs, highly effective. Highly effective. And it's a very, very good way to keep your flies in the zone. So, today we're going to tie this feather tail jig. Probably this color, we'll see. These guys are killer. Now most guys are taking, and girls, are fishing jigs on a tight line rig. And all they're simply doing it, I've read some pretty interesting comments. Um, the younger generation who's into video games calls these things the cheat code of fly fishing. 
I heard that one recently. That's kind of funny. Pretty good analogy. Um, I don't think there's really any cheat codes in fishing, to be quite honest with you. I think uh, work on your skill and everything else is secondary. I'm a fly tire by nature for the most part. This is what I do for a living right now. Um, I do take some people fishing on occasion, but more often than not, I'm spinning bugs and going fishing myself regularly. But I will tell you this, and I tie thousands of flies a year. This is less important than your ability to employ any of those techniques. Hands down. Work on that stuff first. There's no magic bullet. It's fun to tie. These things are fun to fish. But I will argue that the means by which this fly gets into the zone, which is this head on the front, is way more important than what's at the back of this hook. But I digress. Like I've said before, there's a million different ways to skin a cat. There's all different rabbit holes you can go down with fly design. Ultra realistic, suggestive. I like to do a little bit of everything. Um, I also continue to like to fine tune patterns until I feel like I can't fine tune them anymore. So, that being said, we're going to tie this guy right here. Ooh, that's a lot larger than most jigs guys are fishing. That's about four inches. Hmm. So you know my take on uh, when it comes to fishing bait fish and streamers and things of that nature. Give them something that's going to turn their head, right? Now, that being said, these smaller versions here, ooh, yeah, I know some of your guys are probably like, wow, that's pretty sweet. These guys work just as well from time to time. Time and a place for both. I'll talk a bit about, a bit about both of these in the tie video. I might even, heck, I'm going to, I'll do this guy next to follow up with this. But then I have a whole slew of other things I'm going to show you guys. Give you a sneak peek. So my friends who fish this will know what I'm talking about. This guy right here is legit. That's a really, really good one. And as you can see here, because of the style of the jig head, it stands on its head. Any of you bass fishermen out there are familiar with net heads? Killer stuff. You can also tie these on those. I'm going to talk about that in the video as well. These things are awesome. Um, I could spend hours showing you pictures of some of the catches I have friends and some fellow guides I tie these for. Some very, very impressive fish. Um, super fun to tie. It's a real easy one. One, two, three. There's four materials in this. Five if you include the eyes. Jig hooks. Uh, these are more readily available now with lead heads Excuse me, on them. Or you can go the super crazy route with the giant tungsten slotted beads as well. These lead heads are much more dense, so hence they're going to sink quicker for the most part, as fast if not faster than some of the tungsten, because they got more mass to them. Uh, there's a few companies now that are actually selling these um, in the fly world, so it's crossed over from the conventional tackle to here. I've gone full in on the rabbit hole. I'm pouring all my own jigs. I've found a hook that I absolutely love. Um, it's a custom hook. Not a custom hook, but it's more of a conventional tackle style jig hook that I'm utilizing for these. Hands down, awesome. Painting them as well. You don't have to paint them, but you can. Um, you don't need to get into that. If you want, you can buy painted jigs. I'm actually going to start selling them on the webpage. Uh, probably after the first of the year, you're going to start to see a section on there where you can purchase these jig heads from me exclusively if you want. These are all made in-house. Paint them to a slew of different colors, and then you can have at them. Um, paint will chip from time to time, especially if you're in close contact with the bottom. But it really doesn't matter the fish to lead them. The paint on the jig heads is more for presentation. looks really good when they're clean. So enough of me talking. We'll get into this. Uh, I'll show you how to tie these things. They're a lot of fun. They're a heck of a lot of fun to fish, too. All right? All right, folks. So today we're going to tie this feather tail jig. But as you can tell, I have a different style of jig head in here. This is a standard ball jig. This is a Ned head. This Ned head's a 3 seconds. This is a 1 8 The reason why we're going to tie this on a Ned head, you've seen me tie jigs on regular heads. The difference between the two of these is simple. When you fish with these, Ned heads, if you ever fish with them, very prevalent in the bass world, they stand on their head because they have like a dinner plate at the jig portion of this hook. 
So if you want something that's going to have more of a extreme vertical up and down action, this is the kind of jig you want to use. This is lighter. I consider this what I would say a finesse style uh, jig. Um, I wouldn't fish it. You can go pretty heavy on your if you're one of those guys that likes to fish, mo fish mono rigs and things of that nature. Um, but you're definitely going to have a point where it might be a little too heavy. So um, you can dictate however you see fit. Um, these both of these style of jig heads are readily available in the conventional world, and you're starting to see more of the regular ball style jig heads um, being sold in fly shops. Uh, these I pour myself, and I powder paint them also and, and cure them and bake them. Uh, this is on a size 1 hook, which is what we're going to tie with today. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, I'm going to actually have a link um, for how to purchase these for me if you want to help me out because you enjoy what uh, I provide you guys. Feel free. Uh, that should be up by week's end. Or you can get them anywhere else. Um, you don't necessarily need specifically need this. You can typically do any kind of uh, standard jig, or if you want, you want to be a little bit more environmentally conscious, you can use some of these larger uh, slotted tungsten beads, smaller jigs. As you can see, this is a smaller variation. Um, this guy's kind of the limit. I'm going to tie it on this style of a head today, just so you can kind of see how it goes. I've got a few other jig style flies I'm going to show you over the course of the next few months that are pretty awesome. Um, but you know you can get crazy with these. We're gonna we're gonna tie this one in this configuration today, this olive over white. But you can go crazy with different color combos. You know if you want to get really bait fishy looking, you know the gray and the white. You can put some grizzly feather, feathers and stuff like that in there. But I digress. So the first the first thing we want to do is we have to measure our tails. And what you'll find with these style of flies is. I want a tail that's going to swim. And when you hear me swim, you're like, oh, well, this is a jig. It's going to be kind of vertically moving up and down the water column. That's correct. However, this style of fly, what we really wanted to do achieve when we, me and a few of my other uh, guide friends that we discussed these, is we wanted a tail that's going to flutter on the drop. So in order to do that, you need to have it a little bit longer, so roughly about four inches. So what I typically do is I pre-measure out all my, my feathers and, for my tails in advance uh, on my table here but for the sake of this one four inches is roughly about there so I'm gonna peel back that fluff I'm gonna trim back what I don't need off of those and these are just basically um, whiting uh, American rooster feathers probably some of the best on the market if not the best in my opinion what I'm gonna do is just flatten out that stem a little bit take Actually, i got to put my thread on here first, getting ahead of myself. You can use whatever you want for thread. You know I use a lot of Evis, but I still do like Ultra Thread. This is a uh, Olive Brown, or Brown Olive, UTC 140. We're going to start, and as you can see, I've already pre-painted this uh, jig head in a color that's very similar to that. I believe they call this one almost like a pumpkin, whatever it's called. Um, but it's a really, really cool olive color. Once I've gotten my thread right to where the bend of the hook starts, I'm just going to put a little drop of head cement on there. And then we're going to tie our first feather on the near side in. We're basically going to be doing uh, kind of like what Kelly likes to call in his bang tail, that style of a tail for it or a deceiver. I'm going to take the other feather, tie it in on the side nearest to the camera. and then just work my thread right down and then back over those butt ends those two feathers one little trick you can do if these things are giving you fits if you use UV resin you can take some of the thinner stuff or like the Solaris stuff here put a drop in between the two stems hit it with it and it'll keep those two feathers pretty much right together um, I use that stuff very sparingly because I get contact dermatitis from it extremely bad. I'm sure if you saw in the beginning of the video, I got this like breathing mask thing here. If I have to use this stuff, I put that on. I got goggles the whole nine yards. I got a small fan to blow the fumes away because I am highly allergic to this stuff. Anyway, I digress. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a sparkle brush. You can use whatever you want for filler flash on this. You can use UV 
uh, polar chenille. I like to use these EP sparkle brushes. I mean, you could spin a dubbing loop yourself. Go for it. This is a pearl opal, I believe. I'm going to wrap over those, uh, over that wire. And then I'm just going to take open consecutive wraps. They're probably about an eighth of an inch apart if, for all you out there that like to measure these things. Working my way. And every time I do that, I kind of preen and primp that sparkle brush rearward. Once I've done that, I take my scissors, go right in, separate the fibers from that steel core. Take three turns over it, three in front. And then what I do is I have another pair of scissors that I like to use when I'm doing this stuff that I know are pretty banged up. And also I know which ones are which. You can see here I put a little red line on there. That way I know that these are for cutting wire. I go in there and trim it. Flatten that burr out with my scissors. Wrap back a little ways as you see here. Then you can take your brush if you'd like just to uh, comb that stuff out. Next thing we're going to do is um, we're going to put our belly, because you have to remember these things kind of invert. So we're going to do our belly. I'm, I'm using a uh, mag Magnum dubbing by uh, Laterra. Aaron Laterra makes this stuff and sells it. He's doing quite well with it. It's very virtually the same thing as laser dub, but it's twice the length. It works really good for streamers. So I take about half of what I think I need for that belly, card it in my hand, Lay it right over behind that jig head. Take about five turns over it. Fold it rearward. Advance the thread. Tie it off. You can brush this out right now. It's good to do that with each color. Because then if any comes out, like you have here in this brush, you just pull it out, put it right back in the bag. Next, I'm going to invert it. I'm going to take my next color, which is a dark olive. He calls it uh, Leatherback Turtle. Really happy he made this for me because it's just like the dark olive that I use for the sculpins I tie. Same thing, take half of what I think I need. It's a little too much. Grab it right in the middle with your other hand. Just pull that white fiber out of the way for the belly. Take one turn two turns, each one gets progressively tighter, three, four, five, card it rearward. This is the time if you get any that gets caught around that eye of that jig, you just pull it out with your scissors. Advance your thread in front, just like you see here. Then you're going to take your brush again. Highly recommend half hitching before you do that so you don't lose anything. I typically like to take same thing, brush that stuff out, put it back in there, you get virtually hardly any waste. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take um, one full strand of red crystal flash, grab it in the middle, cut it so you have two. We're going to take one on the near side, right in the center, once, twice, three times. Try and Keep that right at that color line where there's that color break. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Do the same thing on the side closest to the camera. Once, twice, three times. Line it up so it's right about where the color break is. Fold it rearward. And then now we're just going to take our thread and we're going to build a little bit of a thread collar behind that jig head. And then we're going to whip finish. Before we move on to the next step, we'll take a look at our flash. And, and you can do, it typically doesn't matter if one's a little longer than the other, but you can cut them both the same length so that they're kind of relatively the same. Um, you could use black on that too if you really wanted to have a pronounced lateral line. I kind of like the red. It's a nice little accent. And then the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to affix our eyes. So. We're just going to use some super pearl eyes here. Same thing. Take a little drop of the uh, gel Loctite. We're going to put it right in the center. Small drop is all you're going to need. And what I want to do when I lay this on here, as you'll see in a second, is I want that red fiber to be centered 
on that eyeball. And you can go bigger with these when I'm using the net head style um, jig head. You can go slightly bigger with the eyes, but for the sake of time and what I had available at the moment, we'll just use the standard one that I had here. Same thing on this side. Once you get those in place, you can kind of squeeze them together. And then the next step here, um, here's my take. If you're going to use resin, um, you heard me talk about, you know, I, I have an extreme allergy to this stuff because I use countless amounts of it. Lord only knows what it's done to me health-wise. But I try not to touch this stuff as little as possible. So I, I use some, when I do these in mass, like I had to do, geez, 40 dozen of these things about a week or two ago. And I had to glue, do the math on that, how many eyes I had to glue on. And epoxy would have taken me 10 to 20 times longer to do. So instead of uh, grinning and bearing and mixing epoxy and all that other fun stuff, I still use the resin. But what I end up doing is it's a process. I wear safety goggles so it doesn't get into my eyes. I turn this little fan on, which you're going to hear here in a second. Um, and that blows the fumes away from wherever I'm at. I highly suggest if you can do it, you put the fan on the side that's going to push your materials in one direction, if you can. Or towards the camera, so that you're not inherently breathing this stuff in. Um, Typically, I'll put a mask on too, just so I don't breathe this stuff in. Because I, I, like I said, I have an extreme allergy to this stuff. So we're going to use some regular thin. You got feathers and stuff flying everywhere. Feather, uh, thin UV resin. I'm using the Solaris thin, and I'm just going to start right here at the base. with a little bit to fill in where the bottom of those eyes are and I'm going to go up and onto the eyes on each side same thing on the top I'm going to go right in behind that jig head just like you see here let this stuff kind of self level a little bit take a look at it I think that looks about right I take my two torches hit it for three seconds count for a couple and I'll put it on there for about eight to ten seconds wait hit it again just to make sure that it's fairly cured I didn't breathe in any of the fumes. And that's pretty much the head. The net head style of that feather tail jig. And as you saw what just happened there, it kind of stands on its head when you when you hop it. So when that thing goes up and down in the water column, there's a higher probability that's going to stand on its head. If you're not looking for that exact kind of action, then you can always go to the standard ball size jig. Um, really really simple tie it's highly effective if you want to make this a little bit more weedless you could put some liquid fusion through this or some other things comb it through that brush it through whatever um, but these are killer little flies and they absolutely hammer fish so hope you enjoyed the tying video if you did um, tell your friends have them subscribe and if you need to get some of these specific style jigs um, there will be a link in the video for them happy tying and have a good day